Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. So, let's continue reading this book. It's about the sexual revolution by Laurie Penny. Radical feminist book. One of the most radical I could find. And it's been pretty tense. A lot I disagree with. But the benefit of reading something that we don't necessarily like helps us to understand their philosophy and helps us to be able to formulate solutions against what they're proposing uh, and more accurately. Okay, so I skipped ahead a little bit, like two paragraphs, because it wasn't really anything I felt like worth covering, more of like her opinion. She has other stuff that she covers where it's more like chunky, you can dissect what it is she's saying, so I'm going to continue on that path. Okay. We cannot have sexual liberation without freedom from abuse. And we cannot be free from abuse without naming it. Okay, so freedom from abuse. I don't know how she proposes that's going to happen. A great deal of the work of social change is about giving people permission to tell the truth about their own experiences. <coughs> okay. Permission to tell the truth. To articulate the hurt they have suffered so that others might not have to suffer the same. Well, I do feel that we have that in society. I mean, who doesn't love a good tragedy story to read? I, myself, seek those stories out. And I have a balance of your feel-good versus your morbid versus your tragic, versus the underdog, triumphant, a good spectrum so that you can be well balanced and have really good grasp on the world. Only showing one emotion is when I think you run into trouble. So I'm not sure why she's framing it as if you're not allowed to tell your sad story. That's what happened in the 1960s and 1970s when feminists first began to speak about the sexual abuse and domestic violence that were and remain the ugly secrets gnawing at the core of our communities. I mean... Hmm... You know, we'd have to really look at that time period, but the 60s and the 70s was definitely a change in society. We had a lot more drugs being introduced and a lot more strange music. And I think it's interesting how she phrased it, the ugly secrets gnawing at the core of our communities. Families and political institutions. It was a brave and dangerous thing to do then, just as it is now. Uh, I think it depends where you are at. I mean, telling truth to power will always be something difficult. You have to be able to stand on your heels, really dig them into the sand and not waver, so it really does keep the pattern up that to tell truth to power is something that's going to test your spine. The shame of abuse was supposed to be borne by the survivors, largely women and children who were expected to stay silent about what happened to them shielding their abusers from the consequences of their actions, and more importantly, protecting everyone else from the discomfort of other people's pain. I think that's a fair point. I often wonder why so many Christians would keep the child abuse quiet. There are some elements of that in those communities where they become too cult-like, and children are not really told, hey, no one is allowed to touch your body. You have bodily sovereignty. Beware of strangers. Beware of adults. You know, don't trust someone just because they're in a robe. Be very mindful. Be very mindful. Now, I have seen some people kind of do a weird double speak in the Muslim community where they're like, I don't say the phrase why, wal 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 bala or something like that, where, oh, we Muslims supposed to not go to the police to the secular government for our problems, we handle it with monks ourselves. 
I don't agree with that. I think that if someone in the community is harming women, harming children, uh, by all means, go to the secular government. Uh, there's no Sharia law in America, and if you think you're doing justice by covering the sins of a brother or who is doing terrible things to children and his wife, I think you're a monster and you should be put in jail. So I do agree that there are people who are shamed into being quiet so they don't harm the Muslim community or the Christian community. Someone will say, oh, you're exposing the sins of your Muslim brother <clears throat> if you talk about your trauma. It's backbiting. And it's like, what? No. We have to talk about certain things in society so we can find solutions and cure that and rid that. Because we're supposed to forbid evil and stop spreading of corruption. But there are people who, they only want to hear happy news. They don't want to hear anything sad. It's just, they want to be in the, the algorithm of cats doing silly things pranks, stuff like that. They don't want anything about sadness. Now, there are doomers who just stay in that zone. So, I, like I said, I try to have a balance. But I can see what she's saying. Uh, see what she's saying. Because there is a thing in the Muslim community where you're told not to expose your sins. And even though the survivor hasn't sinned, it's still a trauma. But... I think it's important to examine mental health because that's how you're going to help people. So you can learn a lot from other people's pain. That's why I like to hear it because you learn a hardcore lesson and you can spare yourself. A lot of disaster if you hear other people's <clears throat> mistakes. Forgive me if I cough a lot. I've had like a cold for a week. <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be going away. You know, summer cold and whatnot, changing of the pollen. Today... We're moving from a culture that tactically permits the rape and abuse of women and children but criminalizes homosexuality, abortion, and birth control and considers female sexual pleasure to be fundamentally suspect. Now hold on here. Let's unpack this. We're moving from a culture that tactically permits the rape and abuse of women and children. So I would love to see a citation for that. What does she mean by that? No one has permitted that to happen to children. Unless you're a forced child marriage in a third world country. In America, uh, no one is glorifying that. Now you could say Holly Weird is doing that. But that's a topic that isn't really allowed to be discussed on, you know, liberal YouTube. About how child actors are really groomed and passed around. And the leather couches of some of these strange producers and media conglomerate head honchos but like Balenciaga type of talking points right but on the grand scale I'd say no children want to be protected however if you were going to say that the Catholics cover up too much child abuse then uh, yeah you know you, you could make an argument for that uh, you could say that the Catholics are permitting it by hiding it right but I'd say your average Joe wants to protect their children. Now, there have been the porn industry that encourages the violent uh, penetration of women. That is a problem. Most definitely a problem. So if she was arguing from that aspect, I would understand. But just the raw pillaging, like... Viking stuff. No, I don't think that's what we're promoting. Now, she does something clever here, which is slimy. She cram she crams in criminalizing sodomy with birth control. So this, to me, is a pretty shameful tactic. Because a woman wanting to use birth control to not add to her family or... For example, there's women who, when they're making the illegal crossing uh, of the border between Mexico and America, they use birth control because so many women get, you know, uh, sexually assaulted. So they use birth control so they don't get pregnant. It's a very sad reality. But liberals like open borders, so it 
causes more women to be exploited through human trafficking by the cartels across the border, so they're forced to use birth control in order not to get pregnant, right? And to put birth control, something that is not illegal, in the same category as sodomy, I mean, it's just not the same. Uh, abortion and sodomy shouldn't be in the same category either. It's just a, it's, it's, she's putting it as something to be defended and glorified. Because she, then she mentions female pleasure. So she cleverly positions those two phrases in her sentence of abortion and sexual pleasure, implying that sex should just more often be allowed be just for pleasure and not for child rearing child for for reproduction right uh, it, it just seems a bit slimy to me and when she mentions here criminalizing female sexual pleasure that is not true within marriage within a stable relationship where you won't need abortion Right? And to put male sodomy um, and female sexual pleasure in the same sentence shows you she's a really quite perverted, I'd argue. Quite perverted. Just those two things should be dissected separately. To one where the important thing isn't who you have sex with or how often or with how many, but whether or not everyone wants it. So, that's strange. She claims our culture permits violent actions against children and women, and then says, we're moving towards, you know, sodomy, and that that's a good thing. It just seems quite bizarre. More broadly, sexual revolution imagines a world where people are free to have sex and form relationships and build families in whatever way they choose, so long as they are not hurting or violating anyone else. Now, see here, this is that's the libertarian stuff. So she appears to be very communistic, but she has mentioned a libertarian thing right here, or a classical liberal ideal of... You can do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anyone else. So she's going with the consenting adults arguments. And then when she says build families in whatever way they choose, she's also, to me, sounds like she's talking about two sodomites uh, using a surrogate to give them a child, right? And to me, she, she, she's showing more and more her anti-religious alliance because previously she had said her agenda is to get rid of the classical Christian uh, form of the nuclear family she literally said that and so when she says build families in whatever way they choose she's talking about a man who is a eunuch being with a woman who has a beard and them adopting kids. So she's thinking about you can mix match any way you want. And that there shouldn't be a classical, ideal, healthy example. That you can basically just do whatever you want. And it's clever how they say not hurting or violating anyone else. So they don't think of how the children feel without a mom or without a dad. And when they're dealing with a hybrid new situation because it discounts the classical role of man and wife. And now you have different arrangements. And so to them, support is support for the child. As long as the child has food, water, what they perceive as love, the child should be fine. They don't really think about the spiritual connection between the birthing mother the biological father 
and how that is a system that is spiritual. So for us, I would think it's spiritual pain to deny a child that, but for them, they wouldn't see it that way. Which is very clear in the way in which she frames her arguments. It imagines a world where the moral schematic is not how much sex is being had, or what kind, but whether it's wanted. So here, she seems to be getting at the housewife who doesn't want to be humped on all the time by her husband. To, well, a woman can be floating about from bed to bed to bed like a fly on garbage, just going around and around and around. And she says, what kind? So again, when she mentioned sodomy over here, so she doesn't want people to be criticized for sodomy or for women or men who are just can't stop spreading STDs and sleeping around and wrecking homes and this just extreme hedonism. So she doesn't want people to be judged by people being hedonistic sodomites. But she cares just whether it's consensual, whether it's wanted. You can really see how the way in which she frames it, but when you peel back the just point of her sentence, you begin to see what she's about. Whether it's fun for everyone involved. So fun. So she's seriously just focusing on pure pleasure, which can really lead to an end road because that has a cap and you become more and more perverted. When you become more and more perverted, I'd argue you're hurting yourself spiritually, but she doesn't believe in that kind of stuff. And that schematic of consent doesn't just apply to sex. So here we have dissected quite a bit of her stances and truly I don't really agree with much of what she said because when she talks about sexual abuse but then tries to say that it doesn't matter how much sex you have or what kind it only matters what's wanted then it appears that she hasn't thought about how hedonism really melts the minds of men particularly and creates instability for families. If a mother is more focused on her personal pleasure uh, and not, you know, reigning and disciplining that in and maintaining her marriage and not cheating, then we're gonna have a problem. You're gonna have a problem with these open marriages. It's just not a spiritual healthy thing and I believe we will see the fruits, the rotten putrid fruit of the sexual hedonist revolution quite clearly within 20 years, I'd argue. And I think that will push the pendulum back into the sane realm of be with your husband, be with your wife, and discipline your desires and don't let the lust demons control you. But here, we can definitely see how her sexual contract is very different than one that religion would argue. She cleverly mentioned sexual abuse and then mentioned sexual freedom. So she really frames it and builds you up to look at this tragedy that happens to men and women in the 1960s and 70s when they were talking about it. And today, the Sexual revolution is going to imagine a world where people are free to have sex any ways they want. They can build families any way they want. So her, it's all inhibitions are gone. You don't have to control that. It's free love. You can be very animalistic. Just like a, a dog humping on a pillow. Very gross, slimy. Just no class, no set of boundaries. This is what I imagine. You know, for her, it sounds like she wants brothels and, you know, just sort of decadence, decay, rot, that really undermines the safety and security of the nuclear family and religious groundings. She wants, essentially, Babylon, right? She wants Babylon and, 
you have to be very mindful of these people who constantly put sexual pleasure on the minds of women. Because it makes it sound as if intimacy with your husband is going to end up being boring and that it's more free and exciting and fun to be passed around every guy in the neighborhood and, you know, get abortions and chug birth control and sterilize your womb. It's very strange. Very strange. But the book is valuable in the sense that we're learning more and more about their philosophy and we're going to be able to, inshallah, create arguments against them because they'll gain traction to people who want to see what it's like on the other side of the fence. So we have to be mindful of that and help people to formulate their arguments against such people who seek to corrupt them and lead them down the witchy path, I'd argue. Let me know what you think. By the way, if you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Milan Archive. Hope to see you there.